Welcome, future educators. Today, we'll be discussing brain development, specifically the parts of the brain and their functions. As teachers, knowing how the brain develops and functions helps us create more effective learning environments for our students. When you understand the brain, you'll see why some students excel in certain tasks while others might need extra support. Let's dive into the brain structure and see how this impacts learning. Left right brain hemispheres continuum. What is this? As it says here, the concept of the left right brain hemispheres continuum is based on the idea that the two hemispheres of the brain, left and right, are specialized for different types of cognitive functions, but they also work together in a complementary manner. The brain is divided into two hemispheres, the left and the right. You may have heard people say they are left brained or right brained, but the reality is that these hemispheres work together. The left hemisphere is more logical and analytical, while the right is more creative and intuitive. For example, when a student solves a math problem, they primarily use the left side, but when they draw or create something artistic, the right hemisphere becomes more engaged. Understanding this balance will help you tailor activities to engage both hemispheres, helping students develop holistically. As you can see from this illustration, the brain is divided into two halves. We'll go into more detail about the specific functions of each hemisphere in the coming slides, but for now, just note that both hemispheres have unique roles, and they work in harmony to manage all the tasks our brain handles. Left Hemisphere Logical and Analytical Thinking The left hemisphere is your brain's problem solver. It excels at logical reasoning and critical thinking. For instance, when you're teaching students to analyze a text or break down complex information into smaller parts, they're using this part of their brain. A good example would be when you ask students to interpret the plot of a story in sequential order. Encouraging logical thinking through puzzles, math problems, or structured debate strengthens the left hemisphere. Left hemisphere language and verbal skills. This part of the brain is also responsible for language and verbal skills. Reading, writing, and speaking all involve the left hemisphere. When students are learning how to read and sound out words, this hemisphere is actively engaged. For example, think about when you're teaching phonics to young learners, their left hemisphere is working hard to decode sounds and associate them with letters and words. Left Hemisphere, Detail-Oriented The left hemisphere is all about details. It focuses on precision and order. For instance, when a student writes an essay, they are focusing on grammar, spelling, and the order of their ideas, this requires detailed thinking. As future teachers, you will have students who are naturally more left-brained, and they will excel in tasks that require close attention to the finer details, such as mathematics or proofreading. Next is, right hemisphere, creativity and intuition. Now, let's look at the right hemisphere. It's associated with creativity and intuition. When students brainstorm ideas for a project or engage in an art activity, the right hemisphere is at work. Think of a time when you've asked students to come up with creative solutions to a problem, maybe designing an invention or imagining a new world in a story. That's their right brain coming alive. It's more holistic, meaning it sees the big picture rather than just the details. Right Hemisphere, Spatial Awareness The right hemisphere also manages spatial awareness. This is the part of the brain that helps students understand maps, shapes, and patterns. For example, when a student is navigating through a maze, doing a puzzle, or working on geometry, the right side of their brain is working. It helps them understand how objects fit together, recognize faces, or even estimate distances. Right Hemisphere Emotional Expression Another function of the right hemisphere is processing emotions. It helps us understand both our own emotions and those of others. When you notice a student interpreting someone's tone of voice or recognizing a classmate's facial expression, they are using their right brain. This is especially important in developing social skills and empathy in the classroom. In summary, the left hemisphere is responsible for logical thinking and detail-oriented tasks, while the right hemisphere handles creativity and emotional awareness. Both sides are equally important. As teachers, it's crucial to create a balanced learning environment where students can develop both hemispheres, whether it's through art, problem solving, or discussions about how they feel. Also, remember that although equal in size, these two sides are not the same, and do not carry out the same functions.
Both hemispheres of the brain communicate with each other through a structure called the corpus callosum. This is a bundle of nerves that acts like a bridge between the two hemispheres. It's what allows the left and right sides to coordinate and work together. This image shows the corpus callosum. Although the two hemispheres specialize in different functions, the corpus callosum allows for seamless communication, enabling complex tasks that require both logical and creative thinking. Brain Features and Characteristics Here are some fascinating facts about the brain. Did you know that the brain weighs only about 3 pounds? That's just 2% of your body weight, yet it consumes 20% of the body's oxygen. This is why regular physical activity can help improve concentration when we increase oxygen flow, we help our brains function better. And here's another fun fact, a baby's skull has around 300 bones, which fuse over time to form 206 bones in adults. This helps the brain grow in size, especially during the critical early years of life. Lastly, those wrinkles you see on the brain are called sulci. These wrinkles increase the brain's surface area, allowing it to process more information. Before we move on discussing the major parts of the brain, let's talk about this concept, brain plasticity. One of the most amazing aspects of the brain is its plasticity which refers to its ability to change and adapt as a result of experience. This means that the brain is not fixed but is constantly being shaped by the activities we engage in and the environments we're exposed to. For us as educators, this highlights the importance of providing rich, stimulating experiences in the classroom to promote positive brain development and lifelong learning. Main Brain Parts Overview Now, let's move on to the three main parts of the brain, the cerebrum, cerebellum, and brainstem. Each of these parts is essential for different functions. We'll take a closer look at each one. This illustration shows where the cerebrum, cerebellum, and brainstem are located. Each part plays a key role in controlling everything from movement to memory. Next is, this other important parts of the brain, the four lobes. As you can see, the cerebrum is divided into four lobes, frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. The frontal lobe is responsible for decision-making and problem-solving, while the parietal lobe processes sensory information. The temporal lobe handles hearing and language, and the occipital lobe is responsible for vision. Now let's delve on the main parts one mentioned earlier, cerebrum. Let's start with the cerebrum. It's the largest part of the brain, responsible for higher brain functions like thought and action. The cerebrum consists of the cerebral hemispheres and accounts for two-thirds of the total weight of the brain. The cerebrum controls voluntary movements and also plays a key role in memory, attention, and decision-making. Think about a time when a student raises their hand to answer a question that's their cerebrum at work, coordinating both their physical movement and their thinking. As teachers, recognizing the role of the cerebrum helps us appreciate the cognitive processes involved in learning and the importance of nurturing these skills in our students. Here's another look at the cerebrum and its four lobes. Each lobe has specific tasks, but they all work together to make sense of the world around us. For example, when students listen to a teacher, the temporal lobe helps them process what they're hearing, while the frontal lobe helps them make sense of the information and decide how to respond. Next, the cerebellum coordinates movement and balance. When students learn how to ride a bike or play a sport, their cerebellum is at work. It helps them make smooth, coordinated movements. If this part of the brain is injured, it can cause issues with balance and coordination, making it difficult for people to move properly. Next part on our list is brainstem. Area at the base of the brain that lies between the deep structures of the cerebral hemispheres and the cervical spinal cord. On this next slide, here is where the brainstem is located. It's at the base of the brain, near the cerebellum and underneath the cerebral cortex. The brainstem is vital for controlling basic life functions, like breathing, heart rate, and sleep. It's also responsible for controlling reflexes. The brainstem is also divided into three parts, the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. Even small damage to this area can have significant effects, including problems with movement, speech, or even consciousness. In this illustration we have a closer look at the division of our brainstem. At the upper area connected to the cerebrum, we have the midbrain, while pons is at the center of the brainstem, and then directly connected to the spinal cord is the medulla oblongata. 
Midbrain is involved in motor control, vision, hearing, and regulating the sleep-wake cycle. It also contains centers important for the reflexes associated with these functions, like eye movement and auditory processing. While pons, connects the cerebellum to the rest of the brain and plays a key role in regulating breathing and sleep cycles. It also helps relay information between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. And lastly, medulla oblongata, it is responsible for autonomic functions such as heart rate, breathing, blood pressure, and digestion. It is vital for reflexes like coughing, swallowing, and sneezing. As we can see, disorders affecting the brainstem can be very serious. From speech issues to respiratory problems, damage to this small area can have widespread consequences. This underscores how essential it is to protect the brain from trauma and injury. Speech disorders, vestibular disturbance, abnormal consciousness, and respiratory disturbance are a few examples of possible outcomes of brainstem disorders. Such disorders can be caused by trauma, tumors, strokes, infections, and demyelination, multiple sclerosis. Complete loss of brainstem function is regarded by some experts as equivalent to brain death. Now let's move on to the other brain parts. There are other important parts of the brain that we haven't covered yet, the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, Wernicke's area, and Broca's area. Each of these plays a unique role in regulating body functions and communication. Let's discuss first the hypothalamus. Let's discuss first the hypothalamus. As mentioned here on our slide. The hypothalamus contains a control center for many functions of the autonomic nervous system, and it has effects on the endocrine system because of its complex interaction with the pituitary gland. Also, hypothalamus regulates homeostasis, meaning maintaining body's internal balance, controls body temperature, hunger, thirst, sleep-wake cycles, and hormone release from the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus is like the brain's thermostat. It also influences emotional responses and the fight-or-flight reaction. When students feel stressed or anxious, the hypothalamus is heavily involved. Injuries or diseases affecting the hypothalamus may produce symptoms of pituitary dysfunction or diabetes insipidus. In the latter disorder, the absence of vasopressin, which promotes the reabsorption of water in the kidneys, induces the rapid loss of water from the body through frequent urination. Hypothalamic disease can also cause insomnia and fluctuations in body temperature. So in this next slide, we can see here that this is where our hypothalamus is located. Kindly pause the video if you need time to internalize and memorize where it is located. Next is the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland, often called the master gland, controls hormones and influences growth, metabolism, and puberty. It releases growth hormones during childhood and adolescence, which is why it's so important for teachers to understand the physical changes students undergo during this stage. And in this illustration, this is where the pituitary gland is located. Next on our list is Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area, located in the left hemisphere, is key for understanding spoken and written language. Damage to this area can result in Wernicke's aphasia, or a person might struggle to understand language, even though they can still speak fluently. If we look in the structure of the brain here in the temporal lobe is where it is located. Next one you see here on our screen is where the Broca's area of the brain is located. Located in the frontal lobe. Broca's area, also in the left hemisphere, controls the production of speech. When Broca's area is damaged, it can lead to Broca's aphasia, where individuals know what they want to say but struggle to physically say it. This can be frustrating for those affected, and it's something teachers should be aware of when working with students with speech or language difficulties. Lastly, as mentioned earlier, aphasia is a condition that affects a person's ability to communicate, typically resulting from damage to Wernicke's or Broca's areas. Wernicke's aphasia affects comprehension, while Broca's aphasia affects speech production. Global aphasia is more severe and impacts both areas. These language disorders highlight just how complex the brain's communication network is. Why this matters? By understanding brain development, we gain insight into how students learn and how best to support them in the classroom. Whether we're helping them solve problems, encouraging creativity, or teaching them how to express their emotions, Everything we do as teachers taps into these vital brain functions. 
With this knowledge, you'll be better equipped to foster a learning environment that caters to each student's unique brain development. In summary, we've covered the basics of brain development, focusing on the different parts of the brain and their functions, and how these relate to learning and teaching. As future educators, this knowledge will be a valuable tool in your teaching practice. Understanding the brain helps you tailor your teaching strategies, making you not just a teacher but a facilitator of your students' cognitive and emotional growth. Thank you for your attention, and I'm excited to see how you'll apply these concepts in your future classrooms.